This video will go over the most important diseases in terms of the ones that are most famous or most likely to be asked about the AP test, asked about on the AP test. So we call these notable diseases. Notable means that, again, they're, um, they're ones that have been around for a while or they've made the news recently, those kinds of things. So you have a paper that looks like this and you're going to watch the video where I'm going to go through a PowerPoint presentation and you're going to fill in your chart on this side and then um, the back side of your chart which looks like this. All right. And we've added some new ones recently, the last couple years. We've added um, measles and we've added Zika to the list. And you're going to also... So the first one to put on your list, and you'll notice that you have categories on your chart that say pathogen and or vector um, here, and then health impacts and other important information. So you want to go ahead and copy into the boxes these items like that. So malaria is um, a protozoa that's carried by mosquitoes. So we say that the mosquitoes are the vector, um, but the actual disease is a protozoa. Now a protozoa, if you don't remember from biology, is a single-celled organism that's a complex cell. So it's a eukaryotic cell. So bacteria are also single cell, but bacteria are prokaryotes, which means they don't have as many organelles and they're not as complicated. Whereas eukaryotic cells are more complicated with all different kinds of organelles. And so protozoa are one cell, but they are eukaryotic, and that's why we call them protozoa instead of bacteria. So um, you need to know that malaria is a protozoa, not a bacteria. So it is um, fever and chills and kills millions each year. The places where it kills a lot of people, the medicines are hard to get, and if you're going to travel to Africa on a missions trip or on safari, you can get anti-malarial shots before you go, and most people do when they go to Africa from the U.S. They get their shots. Um, not just Africa, but also India or Southeast Asia or sometimes in some places in South America. Um, but people who live in these places don't have the money or the resources for millions of people in those countries to get the shots. And so millions die each year. There's a lot of um, organizations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation who provide a lot of money for things like mosquito nets to prevent malarial deaths. DDT. So DDT is uh, controversial because it's one of the most effective things against mosquitoes that carry malaria, but yet it's really harmful for the environment and your top predatory birds like bald eagles. So there's kind of good and bad with DDT. It's not completely clear. The next one is West Nile. Now this one is a virus carried by mosquitoes, so we also have mosquitoes again but this time it's a virus, and you need to know, again, it's the vector, which is the carrier of the um, disease, is the mosquito. We have West Nile in California, even in Santa Clarita. Now, nobody has died in Santa Clarita as a result of catching it here. Um, we've had a, a death or two in the past 10 years, but the person went on vacation to, like, Texas and got the virus there and then came back to California. But we do have uh, reports every year of some dead birds that tested positive for West Nile. So we know it's in Santa Clarita in the mosquito population here. Now, fortunately, we don't have a ton of mosquitoes in California, in Santa Clarita, sorry. Uh, one of the things that you can do to help prevent the small amount that we do have is to go around your yard and empty out um, uh, containers. The sprinklers can fill up 
a little bucket out there or a sand toy or a saucer from a potted plant. Those kinds of things need to be emptied out because mosquitoes breed in standing water. They don't breed in running water, they breed in standing water. So if you empty out those things, it can prevent mosquitoes from breeding. And that's one way you can prevent it. The next one is cholera. Cholera is a bacteria that's found in water, and we used to have cholera in the U.S., but we don't because we have really good sanitation. But the wagon trains that used to go across the Midwest to go to Oregon or even just stop in places like Colorado or Montana, um, they used to come across streams and rivers that had cholera and die. Even in the cities, they used to have cholera. So because of our good sanitary practices, we... Um, don't have cholera anymore and so that is a really big deal to not have that but in other places so if you have somebody who has cholera it's found in the feces and if they have diarrhea and they have diarrhea too close to where people get their water from the well or from a stream or a river they can drink in that cholera bacteria and that's how it spreads so easily so um, boiling the water helps um, and you're do, using disinfecting tabs and water, that helps. But you can see from the picture up here that um, people, you know, they don't have faucets in their house with clean water. And so drinking clean drinking water is a big challenge, and it's for a billion people. So if we have 7 billion people on the planet, 1 in 7 don't have clean drinking water. That's a real big problem. So Giardia is something we do have in the United States. It's a protozoa. There's a picture of it here. And it's found in water. Um, mostly if you get Giardia, you mostly have a lot of diarrhea for like a month. Um, sometimes people die from uh, dehydrating. When, when you have diarrhea, you usually die from dehydration. Um, and that's the cause of death. But Giardia is not as deadly as cholera, but um, it's not something you want to get. We have it in our rivers and streams in the U.S. So if you're hiking or you're backpacking and you're going to drink stream water, um, you bring a filter with you. And I've done that before. Water is extremely heavy to carry, so you don't want to have to carry your water on your back. So people um, carry a water filter, sometimes iodine tablets, um, or they boil their water out um, in the back country when they're going to backpack to kill the Giardia. The next one you need to know about is HIV, um, which causes the disease AIDS. So the actual virus is called the human immunodeficiency virus. And it's found in the blood and in the sexual secretions. And um, it, it's a virus that will attack the immune system and then, so technically, people don't die from the virus. They die because the virus has attacked the immune system. And so they die from things like pneumonias or cancers that the body can't fight off. So when you have a whole bunch of diseases because your immune system was destroyed by the virus, um, they say you have AIDS, autoimmune um, deficiency disorder, or syndrome, sorry. Um, and so we have it in the U.S., but it's epidemic in Africa. Millions and millions and millions of people have it there, and they die, which causes a lot of um, demographic issues that we studied in Chapter 8. So if you catch HIV, it actually sits in your body without doing a whole lot of harm for about five to seven years. And then after that, the virus starts replicating a lot and then your, it, it actually kills off helper T cells. And so your helper T cells, part of your immune system, drop and then you can't fight off other diseases. So if you participate in risky behaviors, um, then you should have an HIV test periodically to check if you have caught it. So risky behaviors include things like intravenous drug use and sharing needles. Um, or having unprotected sex. So that is um, the risk factors for HIV.
found not always. Oh, let me go back. Foodborne illness, a lot of times people call it food poisoning, but it's not a poison, it's actually a bacteria. So the most common types of um, foodborne illness are E. coli and salmonella. Are They're not the only two kinds, they're just two of the kinds. There's also ones like norovirus and things like that. Um, actually, you should add one because this is very popular right now um, because people get it on cruise ships a lot. Not as much anymore because the cruise industry is like the leaders in killing norovirus. So a lot of foodborne illness right now is caused by norovirus. So I want you to add that because um, the AP test often asks about recent happenings. And so the, some of the bigger outbreaks are noro. Noro doesn't usually kill you. Um, it just, you throw up and have diarrhea for like 24 hours and it's awful. I've had it before and it is something you don't want to have. It can also weaken you so that you're more susceptible to other diseases, which is how um, older people die from foodborne illness. They have diarrhea and vomiting and it weakens them so bad that they end up in the hospital just weak and shaking and then their hearts um, can have problems or they can end up with a stroke. Um, because their bodies are so worn out from the pathogen. So they don't actually die from E. coli or salmonella or noro, um, but it weakens them so much that they die from something else. So E. coli, you need to know um, E. coli is usually found in beef. We actually have it in our intestines too. Um, there's a super deadly form of E. coli called 0157H7. I know, 0157H7 is the super deadly one. Um, so how do you prevent it? Well, it's found in beef, not all beef, but contaminated beef. You can't tell that it is, so that's why you cook your meat to the proper temperature. Salmonella is usually... So salmonella is usually found in chicken, not always. Um, so again, cook your chicken to the proper temperature. If you cut chicken on a cutting board, you gotta wash it thoroughly with soap and hot water um, and don't cross-contaminate. So don't put your vegetables on the same dish that had raw chicken. You always wash everything carefully. Sometimes these pathogens can wash onto other foods. So about 15 years ago, we had a problem with um, beef E. coli from a feedlot. It was in their poop and the poop from rain washed onto a spinach field. And then that spinach was packaged and sent all over the country to people to eat raw as a spinach salad. And a few people died from that. And so um, that was a really big deal. That happened in northern in Salinas, which is central California by Monterey. And they actually tracked it and found out what happened. So as we have industrialized agriculture, we have more and more of these foodborne illnesses. Yellow fever, that one's um, not found in the US. It is found, um, as you can see, this is a picture of Africa. It's also found in Central America and South America. So when your liver becomes damaged, your skin turns yellow, which is why they call it yellow fever. So it used to kill a lot of people. It still kills some, but not as often. So think about the Panama Canal that was built in the early 1900s. A lot of the workers came down to Panama to build the canal, and they died from yellow fever. So again, it's something that used to kill people a lot back in the day. Not too much anymore, but it still happens. Cryptosporidium, so the reason why we learn about this one is because of drinking water. So it is a particularly tough bacteria that has a shell or a capsule that surrounds it and it is immune to chlorine. We found that out in Milwaukee when the regular tap water, people started coming down sick and dying from tap water and they found, well, and they treated their tap water they had for decades and they had been they thought was completely safe, but then they discovered that cryptosporidium um, wasn't killed by chlorine. And so now all the water treatment plants, they zap their water with ozone or UV light, which does kill the cryptosporidium. So up at our water treatment center at the top of Central Park, 
we use ozone actually. We zap it with ozone and it kills all bacteria. So not just the crypto, but everything in there. And it's the same for bottled water. Bottled water is not any safer than tap water in terms of bacteria. Um, they have to do the same kinds of treatment because where does the bottled water come from? It comes from the same sources as tap water. So you need to know about crypto and about what happened in Milwaukee. Hepatitis, so there are actually more than A, B, and C. There's actually also D and E, but they're not as common. So blood, hepatitis B is mostly blood or sexually transmitted. Hepatitis A can be what's called an oral fecal. So if somebody has hepatitis A, they go to the bathroom, they go poop, they wipe their bottoms and have a tiny little bit on their hands um, and they don't wash their hands, they can transmit that hepatitis A to you. And that has happened before, which is why there's laws that say wash your hands. If you're a worker at a restaurant, you have to wash your hands. And that's the law. Um, again, if you actually have hepatitis A, you're not allowed to by law work in food industry. Um, and that's why a lot of places make their employees wear gloves too, just to be on the safe side. It is rare, but it does happen. So there are vaccines now. So a lot of you um, have vaccines for hepatitis A and B. C is less common. Um, so they are developing vaccines for these viruses. The flu, the common flu, um, this is important. Sometimes there's test questions that say, which is a virus that still kills tens of thousands in the US every year? And a lot of kids will say HIV, but that's wrong. HIV doesn't kill tens of thousands each year. It's the regular flu, which is why they emphasize doctors want you to get a flu shot. So if the flu mutates a lot, um, which is why you need a new flu vaccine every year because of the mutations. So um, now they start to, it takes several months, I mean almost a year to create enough um, antivirus antibodies to make enough doses for millions of people in the US. So they have to about a year ahead of time try to predict which flu strains um, are going to hit the US. And sometimes they predict great and the flu shot works well, and sometimes they don't predict right and the flu shot kind of works, kind of doesn't. So flu shot usually has about three to four different strains of virus in it. So they have the antibiotics. And by the way, it's dead virus, so you can't get a, the flu from getting a flu shot because they inject you with dead viruses. Um, and then your body develops an immune response. So it's the body doesn't know that they're dead. The body's like, oh no, viruses. So the body creates antibodies against that specific strain or strains of flu. So if you're out and about and somebody has the flu and they breathe on you and you breathe in those viruses, your body has already made the antibodies and it goes, no problem, I have the antibodies against that strain of flu and then you don't get sick from it. So um, can you still get sick from the flu with a flu shot? Yes, for a couple of reasons. If there's a strain that did not make it into the flu shot, you can still get sick. Sometimes, um, also some people's bodies just don't make enough of the antibodies, so even if they got the flu shot, they're gonna get a milder case. But vaccines help, they will reduce the how long the flu is for you, how hard it is for you, um, even if it's the wrong strain or your body doesn't make as much antib antibodies. So that's how vaccines work. In the United States, we do not inject with any live viruses for any vaccines. Um, so they are all dead viruses. 
So a few years ago, we had something called H1N1, which is the swine flu that killed, or sorry, it didn't, it, it might have killed a few, not very many, but the young people came down with it. I remember about 10 years ago when I was teaching, all of my students, I would say about half of them came down with H1N1, and I did not. So it usually, it's a strain that um, infects young people. Similar to the Spanish flu that happened at the end of World War I in 1918, it was a, um, it was one that killed off young people instead of older people. Usually, usually flus kill off the elderly, but on occasion there's one that comes through that makes young people sick. Whooping cough. So we um, have newer outbreaks of whooping cough due to people that um, we call them non-vaxxers who haven't vaccinated their children. And so we don't have herd immunity in some communities anymore. What herd immunity is, is that you have to have some number like 93% of the people vaccinated to protect the people who can't get vaccinated. So there are some people who cannot get vaccinated because of um, bad immune systems that they were born with. And, or they are going through chemotherapy or they have leukemia or something like that or they are allergic to vaccines. Um, sometimes that happens. So if all of the other people in the community who can get vaccinated get vaccinated, then it's gonna protect the ones who can't because that, vac that whooping cough or measles or whatever can't make its way through the community. But we have this upsurge in um, people who do not vaccinate and what that's happened is that it's allowed the whooping cough, the bacteria to come through community and infect. Um, the whooping cough is not great. I have had students out with it before um, for an entire month and they got weak and it was just awful for them. And but it, So it has resurged in the United States because uh, we don't have herd immunity in many places. Same thing with measles. Now whooping cough re-emerged in the U.S. in a lot of numbers several years ago. Measles re-emerged in Europe first because of um, non-vaccinators, and now it's we have re-emergences in the United States. So the famous one that happened last year, so let's go ahead and add it to our PowerPoint, is in Disneyland. We had an outbreak of people there because somebody had brought it into the park and infected people that were not vaccinated or children who were too young to be vaccinated if they were just a few months old. So measles is very contagious. You can just be in the same area from somebody who um, has it and they just have to breathe on you and you get it. Very highly contagious. And it can cause complications. Now, a lot of people get measles and they don't have a whole lot of problems and then other people get measles and they um, have complications um, and death from it. So a new one that we're adding this year is Zika. So anything that's about two years old or more um, is fair game on the AP test. So Zika is now um, over two years ago that we had an outbreak of Zika. So mosquitoes transmit the virus. Um, so you can see from the picture here that the main problem is that it um, causes birth defects like a small head, which also decreases brain size too. So the reason why it made the news was because of the Summer Olympics, they had Zika problems in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And um, People had gone down there and even um, picked it up and brought it back to the U.S. And so this is a big problem because a lot of people who get Zika who aren't pregnant just kind of have like the flu and, um, and a rash. But then they can actually sexually transmit it. So I'm going to add this too. Sorry. Um, so it can also be sexually transmitted as well. So if your husband goes to, let's say, um, Costa Rica and gets, um, picks it up there from a mosquito and then comes home and has sex 
with um, his pregnant wife, then the wife can get the Zika through sexual transmission. And I spelled transmission wrong. So it's sexual transmission transmitted. There we go. Better. So we do have instances of that now. We're also finding that for most people, it's just like a little mild flu, um, but it's really super bad for pregnancy. But it also can cause some long-term effects as well. But right now, the, the biggest problem that, and the most glaring problem is the birth defects. It's not just in Brazil. It's, it's in many tropical areas, including Africa and Southeast Asia as well. It's an older virus that has sort of re-emerged um, and it's something that we are worried about in the U.S. too because we have the strain of, or the species of mosquito that can carry Zika. So it's something that we need to keep an eye on and try to really figure out. So you have some notes there about urban ecology. So urban means from cities. And so now because we have more people in cities, it leads to higher disease risk. So because we use services, so when you put children in daycare, they can pick up diseases more easily because they're close together versus if kids stay home and not in daycare. Um, if you people come in to clean your house, they can bring in flus or whatever else they have. The more food you buy outside of the home, you open yourself up to people who've prepared it, who have things like hepatitis A. If you go to the spa and you get your nails done and they don't clean your um, the, the, the nail cutters and things, they don't sterilize it in an autoclave where you have heat and pressure, you can pick up a bloodborne disease from the last person who they used it on, if they had the disease. So whenever I go to the nail to get my nails done, I always ask how they sterilize their equipment because you don't want a, mine, a drop of um, contaminated material or blood on, them, on the things that they use. So we didn't used to have as many opportunities to catch a disease as um, before, but now we do. The same thing um, with pre-made food and restaurants because um, you have other people making your food, which is more likely to get you sick than if you made it in your own home. So even though our refrigerator and our preservation techniques have increased dramatically because more people eat at restaurants or get pre-made food um, than cook at home, the levels of foodborne illness have skyrocketed. I just talked about services like a mani-pedi or facial or waxing. Um, whenever you have waxing done, you need to make sure that they have sterile techniques. They do not re-dip the um, kind of like a popsicle stick that they use to put wax. They need to use a new popsicle stick for each person and not re-dip in the pot of wax. In some places that do waxing, they say you get a new pot of wax per person and then throw away the remainder of it to prevent um, things like herpes from being transmitted. If you get a bikini wax, um, that virus can get into the wax. So always ask before you have any waxing done, even on your eyebrows or anything like that, ask how they sterilize um, and make sure that no diseases are transmitted on wax. We talked about mani pedis, all of those kinds of things. Always ask, and even if they look at you weird, ask. It's your health. Health clubs and gyms, you'll notice if you go to the gym that there's usually somebody that walks around with a disinfecting bottle and um, wipes down machines a lot. When uh, I don't go to the gym anymore, but when I used to, um, I used to wipe down every machine because they have the bottles and the wipes there um, before I was on the machine. Indoor pools and hot tubs. Indoor ones tend to carry more pathogens, which is why they have bromine. So in an indoor pool, they use bromine instead of chlorine because there's no light inside. Actually, UV light kills a lot of bacteria. So if you have an outdoor pool or hot tub, 
Um, that UV helps kill pathogens, but when they're indoors, it doesn't, so a lot of times they switch to bromine. And then globalization. So one of the um, issues we've had is Ebola. Oh, you should know about Ebola, which was not on your list, which I should add. So let's go ahead and add Ebola. So Ebola, we had a couple of years ago, and Ebola is a horrific virus, and it is fast moving, and you get sick real quick and die. But we actually had a couple people who were in Africa during an outbreak and actually made it on a plane and traveled to the U.S. before they came down with symptoms, which is rare. Usually you come down with symptoms within like 12 hours. And then once they got to the U.S., they were real sick and they were quarantined. Um, we had a couple of doctors that were helping with the Ebola outbreak in Africa that caught it. They were returned to the U.S. in a quarantined airplane, and because of our medications, they actually survived. And, But it is a quick, quick moving. It basically causes you to hemorrhage, which is to bleed out um, of the body from like all your organs and things. So make sure you know about Ebola. You can even add it to your chart. And then basically higher density. Um, when you up the density of people in a location, the easier it is for diseases to be transmitted. And then also when you have a bunch of people in a certain place in a city, anytime you have flooding or an El Nino flood or hurricane flooding or any earthquakes like in um, Haiti, um, those, when you rupture sewer lines, so it, uh, an earthquake might rupture sewer lines, um, flooding, all flooding ends up getting a lot of pathogens in the water. And then when you have a lot of people and a lot of sewage, that's what ends up transmitting diseases. And that's it for your notable diseases.